I'm sure you read the book, The Creature from Jekyll Island. The Federal Reserve truly is a creature. It's a malicious creature. The purpose of the Fed has never been to help the American public. Please join us for our next live stream Sunday, September 12th at 9 p.m. Eastern. We'll go over current events, past guests, and of course, gold and silver news. Once again, our next live stream will be Sunday, September 12th, 9 p.m. Eastern. See you then. Hello again, everyone, and welcome to another edition of Silver Bullion Television, SBTV. I'm your host, Patrick Vieira. So always, if you are new to our channel or if you haven't already done so, please do subscribe, hit the bell to be notified of new updates, and give us a thumbs up. If you like what we do, we truly do appreciate your support and thank you for it. Dave Kranzler joins us again today with some 30 years of experience in researching and investing in the financial markets. Dave co-manages a precious metals and investment stock fund in Denver, Colorado, U.S., and also publishes the Mining Stock and Short Sellers Journal on his website, investmentresearchdynamics.com. One of Dave's goals is to help people like you and me understand what is really going on in the financial system. It's time to saddle up and silver up for Dave Kranzler. Dave, welcome back to SBTV. How are you doing? I'm doing well, Patrick. Thanks for having me back on. I enjoy doing the show with you. Glad to have you back on, Dave. We always enjoy having you on. One of the fan favorites here. You know, I want to open up with an article you posted on your website, Investment Research Dynamics. And the article was titled, What is the Fed Hiding a Hidden Bailouts of the Banks? The article went into what the Fed has or is quietly hiding from Congress. So can we start by opening up this can of worms? If we have to, I guess we can. <laughs> the, the Wall Street Street on Parade. If, if people in the audience um, don't know about that website, you should, uh, you should definitely subscribe to their it's free and you get, you know, they email you their articles. They, they publish an article, I think, just about every day. And they're ex-Wall Street. It's a husband-wife couple. They're ex-Wall Street um, people. And they've turned, they've turned their sites now for several years into kind of exposing the corruption and, and fraud in the, in the system, specifically as it relates to Wall Street and <clears throat> Washington, D.C. And um, I, I guess... I guess the Fed <clears throat> uh, has a monthly report that it's obligated to give to Congress, and it, it details, you know, their, you know, what they're doing, why they're doing it, how they're doing it, and apparently uh, they've they've removed three of the legacy bailout programs that they were using in, from the 2008 financial crisis, and they resurrected those back in 20, you know, March 2020. And their, their programs, it's the primary dealer credit facility, commercial paper funding facility, and money market mutual fund liquidity facility. And it's, it's basically, you know, they, they'll, they'll, they use those facilities to, to um, kind of cleanse the, the banking and money market system of, of crappy assets, bad assets, bad investments. And it injects it, it injects liquidity into the the money market and and you know basically the, the banking system, and all of a sudden you know they remove these facilities from their report and you know the question is why what are they what are they trying to hide, and there's no way to know I mean and, you know the head the Fed hid the real money supply M3 starting in I believe it was October 2006. So, and, and they actually telegraphed that they were going to do that. This wasn't telegraphed. This was just, you know, a monthly report to Congress, and all of a sudden the facilities aren't on it any longer. And it's not because they're not being used, but it, it suggests that they're being used maliciously or, or um, for, for devious purposes, purposes that go beyond the mandate of the Fed, I would, I would think. Yeah, okay. Well, I guess Congress is asleep at the wheel if they haven't. They haven't noticed this, but um. Well, the Fed is owned by the banks, and anyone who disagrees with that needs to just go and actually dig into the Fed website and look at the the ownership structure. And um, Congress is basically co-opted by the banks. It's you know, it's 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 you know, Congress owns 
is, is owned by the banks. They're among their largest contributors uh, to their campaigns and to various PACs. So, um, and it's, it's just, I mean, the Federal Reserve, you, you, I'm sure you read the book, The Creature from Jekyll Island. Yeah. So, I mean, the Federal Reserve truly is a creature and it's, it's, it's a malicious creature. And it was, it's, it's never been, the purpose of the Fed has never been to help the American public. Dave, you're too kind. Creature is a nice word for the right. Fed, but... <laughs> well, this is a family show, right? <laughs> family show, yes, it is. Let, let's stick with the Fed and, and Taper Talk because it leads into our... Has, has a hand in so many other things. And tapering seems to be one of the first steps with the Fed to show the public that it is going to try to tighten up from loose monetary policies. Is the Fed taper talk a reaction to too much money printed, inflation, transitory inflation, or or why is the Fed starting to talk taper now? It's a good question. Um, I, I mean, it's been getting a lot of criticism all along about how much money it's been printing. And, um, it, you know, even though it, it denies it, it's obviously inflated the largest asset bubble across all assets in the history of the universe. And I mean, I, I think one of the primary purposes, I don't know, maybe they threw out the taper talk there to try and rein in the stock market. I mean, the stock market is, is further off the rails now than it was at the peak in, in early 2000. So, um, it, I don't know. I, I think, in my opinion, the primary purpose is to help jawbone support for the dollar because they're printing so much money right now. And yes, all the central banks are printing money, but the Fed is printing the most amount of money right now. And so it's it's causing the the fastest rate of U.S. dollar devaluation. But it has tools that it can use to keep the dollar propped up. I mean, the currency markets have been rigged by the Fed going back to, I think, I think the Exchange Stabilization Fund was erected in 34 or 36, I forget, 1936, I think. Maybe it was 34 because I think it was uh, part of the Gold Reserve Act. And the, it, it specifically had the mandate, the, the, the fund itself was funded by the Treasury and it was, it was specifically it was specific for the purpose of stabilizing the currency markets. So, and then it morphed into what it's become now, the Exchange Stabilization Fund, after, in 1989, when Reagan signed an executive order that allowed the Exchange Stabilization Fund to um, intervene in the stock market, at, you know, after the 1987 crash, the Dow crashed 22.5% in one day. And I remember it clearly, it was down 25% at one point. And, um, you know, about a little more than a year later, Reagan signed the, the, the executive order that allowed the exchange, exchange stabilization fund to stabilize the stock market. And then when Robert Rubin became Secretary of Treasury, obviously the ex Goldman Sachs, uh, you know, managing, he was the head partner before, you know, when they were partners before it went public. And then he was the chairman of Citibank at one point, might, might have been after he was at the Treasury. But, um, when, when Rubin became Secretary of Treasury under Clinton, that, that exchange stabilization fund started putting his hands in all the markets. So, but to circle back, I think, I think part of the motive for the Fed to talk about the taper is just to get the idea out there and, and, and hopefully, um, you know, hopefully lend some, some jawbone support for the U.S. dollar because the U.S. dollar you know, has been threatening to go into the 80s now for quite some time, and it's managed to stay above 90. And and if you look, if you, you know, just look at charts, when the Fed started mentioning the word taper, the dollar started getting some strength. So um, I, I think there's also, again, I, I don't know. And the funny thing about this taper is that they haven't really ever set a definitive timeline for when they they're going to start the taper. I mean, you know, I guess Goldman Sachs threw out there October. I guess Powell has thrown out there later this year, provided that certain uh, certain economic expansion metrics are met, and he hasn't defined those. So who knows what the triggers are that would cause them to taper? So 
Um, do I think they're going to taper? Uh, honestly, I, in my opinion, I don't think they will. But, I, you know, there's been times in the past when, you know, like there was, I think it was, you know, in the middle of the, of the um, early 2000s housing bubble um, that Greenspan had started talking about raising interest rates and I didn't think he would and I bet against the, the fact that I that he would and lo and behold he started raising rates so um, <laughs> but I mean if they you know and who if even if they do start to taper who cares because they're still printing a lot of money they're printing 120 billion a month so they're saying well well you know we're looking at maybe reducing it at 15 15 billion a month over however many months it takes to get to, to no money printing and um, they're like you know they're, they're still printing money they're still expanding the money supply so you know it's still going to foment more dollar devaluation and more inflation so um, I, it, to me I just I think they're backed into a corner right now because if they do start to taper I think it's going to um, pop the stock bubble I think it's going to uh, pop the housing bubble, you know, and the, if the, the there's so much leverage out there predicated on the value of equities and value the, the value of the housing stock, you know, all kinds of leverage and derivatives, and so essentially the, these asset the, these asset values out here in the stock market and in the housing market are kind of the the foundation of the whole uh, you know web of of insane leverage and derivatives that's been piled into our system and i think if the fed were to were to taper and especially if it were to start raising rates i think we'd have a um a, a, a financial system collapse that would make 2008 look like a day at the beach yeah i think um you know jerome paul is definitely jawboning the the taper i do remember the dollar would be touching 89 and it would start to go back up into the 90s right. and that exchange stabilization fund the plunge protection team so it's we're, we're all over the place with this. But, you know, Dave, they, you mentioned how the, the Fed is really increasing the money supply. And, but yet they want to tighten up on monetary policy. And we are starting to see things like the reverse repo market hitting a trillion dollars a day. And it basically goes unnoticed, uncared. Are reverse repos an indicator for anything? And should we care? That's a great question. I mean... You'd have to be a fly on the wall inside the Fed to understand what their thinking is behind the reverse repos. I mean, for me, I just kind of apply Occam's razor, and and I, if you just look at simplistically what what repos and reverse repos are, the reverse repo, um, so it, they're basically tools that the Fed uses to manage the Fed funds rate, right? And they have a, and their their target range is zero to twenty five percent. And I believe that the reverse repos are evidence that the Fed has printed more money than the banking system can use right now. And there's, we also know there's a shortage of collateral, treasury, you know, treasury collateral, and and um, and you know the highest rated mortgage mortgage backed collateral. So what the because the Fed has purchased so much since 2008, it's it's removed I, since March of. 2020, the Fed's uh, purchased 57 percent of all new Treasury issuance. So, and, and banks need these Treasuries and, and high-grade uh, mortgage mortgage bonds to use as as you know collateral that they put up for for um, you know their business purposes for lending and and um, borrowing and things like that. So, just at the most simple level, if you've got you know across across banks you know the primary dealers and and the and the banks the banks in general and money market funds because that's what the repo system does is it it moves money around from banks who have to, more than they need for their for their daily business to banks who need money and money for, you know it's mainly the money market funds who are lending through the repo system um, but it goes to banks that that may need to balance their books at the end of the day, you know, on an overnight basis or whatever. These these are overnight reverse repo. So what the reverse repo does is the Fed, the Fed basically uh, lends collateral to the banks, and the banks give put up money, put up cash that they have 
and give it to the Fed, uh, you know, and it's an overnight transaction. So in a sense, it what it does is it pulls the liquidity, the amount of liquidity that's being reverse repoed out of the banking system on an overnight basis, right? So I, I, I kind of refer to it as a, as a, a, a um, and it's holding those funds in suspended animation every 24 hours and, you know, it keeps getting rolled forward and obviously it's been snowballing in size. I think the, I think for me, the simplest explanation is that it's, it prevents the Fed funds rate from going to zero and that, that was, or going below zero. And that's, that's why you, you know, I think it was the, I guess it was the July meeting when they raised the, the, the floor on the reverse repo lending rate or the reverse repo rate to 0.05% because it helps them keep the Fed funds rate in the zero to 0.25% target range. So, um, and I guess the effective Fed funds rate has fallen all the way to, to 0.06%. So, um, I mean, beyond that, I think it is, you know, what's, what's crazy about the whole setup is that it's like a giant Rube Goldberg machine, right? Where they just keep layering on ways to try and manage the system. Because on, on one hand, they're adding, you know, 120 billion a month is 4 billion a day in money that they're printing. You know, I don't think they do it every day. It's probably weekly or whatever. <clears throat> but so on one hand, just say on a daily basis, they're, they're injecting 4 billion into the banking system, 4 billion additional, you know, so cumulatively it's been however much they've done since, since uh, March, 2020. And then on the other hand, they're, they're pulling out that liquidity on a 24 hour basis and holding it overnight. You know, so, I mean, it makes no sense. Why don't they just stop printing money? <laughs> it's as, to me, it's as simple as that. If you have to do these reverse repos and you, and, and the size of the reverse repos is growing, doesn't it tell you that you're printing a lot more money than the system can handle? And I think, I think part of it is, is it, it prevents. So if they're doing a trillion and they've been doing a trillion now for what, a couple weeks, I think every night, if, if they're doing a trillion, they're trying to prevent that money from somehow transmitting into the real economy and, and igniting even higher inflation. I mean, let's face it, these guys aren't idiots. You know, when Powell says inflate, he gets up there and says inflation's transitory and he talks about, you know, well, you know, CPI is what, three or 4%? He's lying and he knows he's lying. <laughs> so, you know, I, I, and I think they know that if they don't try to somehow rein in the liquidity they're printing, to me, it tells you they can't stop printing money. And part of the reason they can't stop printing money is they have to fund treasure, new treasury issuance. I mean, the treasury by the end of October is going to have close to a $3 trillion spending deficit this year, and they're going to have to finance that. So it means we've got a lot more new treasury issuance coming. And foreign buyers, according to the most the last couple Treasury International Capital reports, which shows the funds flows between countries, you know, from, from foreign countries into this country or out of this country, tre foreigners have been pulling away from funding our treasuries and they've been our main treasury financier for 30 years. So, so um, to me, it's like if the Fed pulls back on printing money, there's going to be less money available to fund these treasury auctions and it's going to send the, the long end of the curve up. And that, that'll also, you know, prick the asset bubbles. So... <laughs> It's a big mess, and it's going to be interesting to see how this thing unfolds over the next six months. Yeah, you know, Dave, I, I agree. It is a big mess because we have the Fed who is talking tightening, and then we have the government who is really still talking loose, uh, loose policies here, fiscal policies, and something's got to give between the between the two. And on the government end, you know, can they tighten up from loose? money policies or loose fiscal policies can they take away the punch bowl from main street i i mean government spending is is probably the majority of any type of economic i mean it's it's not an efficient form of economic growth but it's 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 you know keeping the wheels or the it's keeping the engine that the engine of the economy, 
you know, with with some fuel in it. I mean, uh, you know, I would argue that on a real growth basis, this our economy's been in contracting for quite a while. Real growth meaning you take the GDP number and apply a, a, a bona fide GDP deflator because the CPI is not a bona fide GDP deflator. That's not CPI. Is, I don't think is exactly what the deflator is, but it's pretty close. So, um, I mean. It, the way John Williams measures inflation is the way the government calculated the CPI in 1990. And according to his calculations, I mean, inflation has been running anywhere from 6 to 10 percent for the last several years, which which means that, you know, when they when they're using a 2 percent deflator or two and a half percent deflator, it means if you use the real number, there hasn't been any economic growth. So. Um, but so to the extent that there, so, uh, to me, it tells you that the private sector continues to contract and and the government is is really the only source of 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 growth out there and you see that and to the extent you can believe the employment numbers it's all it's been education and, and healthcare related and a lot of that is funded by the government medicare programs other various entitlement programs etc so um i don't think the government well I don't, i'm not sure when the last time the government ever did reduce its spending since World War II, <laughs> I'd have to go back and look at the numbers. You know, you can go onto the the St. Louis uh, Federal Reserve website, the the Fred database, and you can take a look. But I mean, our our spending deficit continues to, just to grow every month. So, no, I don't think. I, I mean, I I don't know if the government would even want to reduce its spending. I don't think it could without again crashing the economy. But I don't, I don't, you know, it's just the way the politics work now. So, um, I mean, you know, just the in, the entitlement program alone. I mean, they, they, they won't even, they, they won't even let the uh, foreclosure moratoriums expire. They keep deferring them, right? <laughs> I think, I think we're backed into a corner. The, the Fed is, the government is, everyone is, and at some point, there's going to be an unpreventable collapse, and who knows how long it's going to take. Could be next month. It could be five years from now. Who knows? Yeah, I, I think we're pretty much backed into a corner as well. And, you know, let's say that the Fed does or is able to create this atmosphere of a stronger dollar via tapering or, or whatever else they have planned. And the stronger dollar emerges. Is this going to help stave off inflation? I, I mean, I guess to the extent that it makes imports less expensive, it might, but I mean, there's there's just so much cost inflation built into the entire global economy now from all the money printing that, I mean, expenses for, you know, even for the, the countries that export to the United States, ex the expenses and just, just you know, getting, uh, getting goods shipped over here has gotten, you know, insanely expensive. And I don't think a strong dollar, I mean, it, it might offset the the cost to us domestically somewhat, but it's not going, it may, it may slow down the price rise, but it's not going to, it's not going to reverse it. I, I don't, I think we're, we're stuck with increasing inf inflation until, you know, I think what the Fed would have to do is not just taper, but it would have to start removing a lot of the money that it's printed since, since March 2020. In order to in order to um, cut cut the the rate of growth of in prices the, the price inflation we're seeing and you know I've, I've if you just read through a handful of, of second quarter uh, corporate corporate uh, you know financial reports and the and, and go look at the MDNA there's been you know several CEOs who have said that you know, prices at the intermediate level are forcing them that to pass on prices that are, they're going to pass on this quarter at the retail level. So, you know, for everything that you go out and, and, and purchase, whether it's a necessity or, or a discretionary item, the price is going to be going up over the next three months. Okay, how about the price of gold with that stronger dollar coming in or with them trying to get a stronger dollar? How do you see the outlook for gold? Here, here's the thing about the, the dollar and the gold relationship. Uh, up until in 2013, and I had lunch yesterday with the CEO of a junior mining company that's based here in 
in Colorado. And we were talking about this, and I knew this to be the case, but I hadn't looked at the numbers. And he's a hardcore numbers guy. He's a um, Colorado School of Mines graduate. And uh, um, so we, you know, we were talking about back in 2013 when gold got banged for 200 bucks one day. He, he was over at a conference in, in, in Zurich, and everyone there knew it was manipulation. And apparently Goldman Sachs and J.P. Morgan and a bunch of other bullion banks had loaded up on puts on COMEX gold futures. I don't know if you remember that specifically, but you know, you, you wake up one day, one morning, and I remember it because I was I went and played tennis early in the morning that day, and the guy who who uh, I was playing is he's a financial advisor and thinks I'm a, a, a conspiracy theory gold nut. And he was, you know, giving me a hard time about it. And I didn't say anything. I just knew it was manipulation. But up until that point, so the, the, the R squared on the correlation between gold and the dollar. So when you run a regression analysis um, using, you know, to explain movement in gold and you regress it against the dollar, the R squared was 85%. So that means that you know, the price movement in the price of gold is 85% explained by, by the movement in the dollar, the U.S. dollar. After that date, um, the, the R squared went a lot lower. So it means, it means, you know, gold and the dollar weren't, weren't as correlated as they were up to that point. And to me, that, that's just another facet of what they were trying to do with the manipulation. So that, in other words, they could afford to let the dollar um, fall, or even if they you know, had no choice about letting the dollar fall, it might not boost the price of gold as much as it would have otherwise. Um, and to me, that's because they have pretty good control over the gold price, not complete control, but pretty good control over the gold price using derivatives, uh, you know, the unallocated gold delivery mechanism in, in London on the LBMA, and um, you know, again, it's one of those things that I think for for shorter periods of time, you know, where in this case shorter periods of time might mean, you know, five to ten years versus a century, for shorter periods of time, I, you know, I think they can, they can um, manage the price of gold, but history tells us, you know, over and over that ultimately market intervention fails, and when it fails, it fails badly, and so, again, I don't... I have no idea what the timing is going to be on this, but at some point what they're doing now is going to fail badly. I mean, to me, the fact that they had to all of a sudden, you know, start doing the, the repo operations in September 2019, and I at the time I said, this is, this is just QE in disguise, and it kept growing and growing and growing, and it got bigger, and then boom, in March 2020, under the cover of, of, the, of the virus lockdown, they, they all of a sudden put over three trillion into the banking system all at once. That's because they had to, not because of the lockdowns, but because the banks were were about ready to. In my, I, I you know, I can't prove this, but I, I think the banks were getting ready to collapse. I mean, if you look at the bank stocks back then, they started dropping way before anyone ever heard of the the coronavirus. So, um, and then you know, so now they're doing you know QE, which is permanent repo, right? on one hand, and then they had to layer in reverse repos on the other hand. So to me, it's like every time they layer on some new gimmick to try and, um, you know, to try and control interest rates or to control the price of gold, I think it tells you that it's getting harder for them to control either. Yeah, okay. Um, well, if, if you're a tennis pal, thinks you're a gold conspiracy guy, well, we, we got to get you some new friends, Dave. Maybe we get you off. <laughs> We can get you probably closer to play play some tennis with you. But, you know, I want to ask you about the miners. Do miners prefer a stronger dollar to help with, the say, the operations of a mine, supplies, oil, fuel, things like that? But then it may hurt their product price with the inverse relationship between gold and the dollar. Or do miners prefer a somewhat weaker dollar, which may sting a little bit operationally, but help with their product price? I, you know, I don't know if there's a... I don't know if there's a definitive answer to that. I mean, you know, I would just say in general, you're going to prefer a weaker dollar, you know, because at some point, even though the, 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 the correlation between the dollar and gold isn't as strong as it used to be, I mean, that could change overnight. But at some point, when the dollar starts to tank, the price of gold is going to go a lot higher. 
And um, in general and on average, over a long period of time, there's a, there's a fairly constant spread between the price of gold and the cost of getting it out of the ground. Okay. And, you know, there's times when the cost, the all in sustaining cost of getting it out of the ground might, might be equal to the price of gold. Well, then you see mines shutting down. We've seen that a few times over the last 20 years and that takes away supply and then it helps boost the price, you know, to get it back to a, a a spread that's high enough so that you, you know you can still pull gold out of the ground and sell it profitably so um, we're actually you know between now and, and the next I don't know 18 to 24 months there's there's like a there's like a golden window where you're gonna see the price of gold and the cost of getting it out of the ground is, is really wide it's gonna be really beneficial to um, companies that are putting new mines into production because they're gonna immediately throw off a ton of cash and, and you know their their payback period is, is shorter on their investment to get the mine going so um you know and then at some point i think you'll see costs start to catch up again you know so that you're back to that sort of you know long-term spread between what you can sell the gold for and what it costs all in to get it out of the ground so um honestly i, I i'm not sure especially the big mining companies i'm not sure they really care about the dollar the what the dollar does, these guys only care about getting gold out of the ground as quickly as they can and selling it while they while they have a profit spread locked in. Um, so, um, you know, I mean, it's an interesting question to think about, but I think it's kind of more theoretical than anything. I, I would just say that, you know, mining companies just need to focus on, you know, containing their costs to the extent possible, notwithstanding price inflation and and focus on getting gold out of the ground as efficiently as possible and if you're if you can I, honestly i think if if mining companies wanted to help their their um income statements you know unfortunately wall street only cares about you know what have you done for me this quarter um you know so companies like newmont and barrick they don't care about this but if they cared about the price of gold that much they would just withhold their production they would produce the gold and stockpile it and, and hold supply from the market. And then you'd see the price of gold go parabolic. What, why do you think they, they just simply won't do that? Like I said, these guys are big bureaucratic corporate CEOs and all they care about is their quarterly compensation options. And then, you know, as soon as those vest, all they care about is selling them for as high a price as they can. So if they, you know, if they withhold production for a couple quarters, it's gonna affect their bottom line for a couple quarters and you know, they don't get to sell their, their stock options for as much. <laughs> okay, Dave Kranzler, before we go, can you tell us about Investment Research Dynamics, your mining stock and your short seller's journal, and any other projects that you may be working on? Sure. Um, first, I'd just like to say, I mean, you know, for listeners who are frustrated with this market, I mean, um, it, it is an extraordinarily frustrating market, but we've had... There's been, you know, a few periods like this since 2001 when I started doing this sector. It happened in 2006. It happened in 2008. Obviously, the really nasty one was 2011 to, to the end of 2015. Um, but, you know, we also had a bad period. We ran up really quickly in 2016. But from late summer 2016 until I think I want to I want to say August of 2018, I mean, the market you know, was maybe, it didn't feel quite as bad as it feels right now, but it was similar to this where the, where the mining stocks weren't going anywhere and the price of gold wasn't going anywhere. So, you know, I think at, at some point you just got to hang in there and be patient. And, you know, I showed a chart in my last mining stock journal two weeks ago uh, that basically demonstrated, you know, how undervalued the mining stocks are relative to the price of gold and relative to the to the s p 500 um they're about as cheap as they've been to the mining stocks are about as cheap as they've been to the s p 500 as they have been going all the way back to 1973 and the chart that i had sourced used uh the xau uh, mining stock index because gdx obviously in the amex gold bugs index the huey index doesn't go back that far so um, I mean, on the assumption that the price of gold and silver are going to start moving higher at some point, and that's 
you know, I think that I'm pretty confident they will. Um, the, the mining stock sector is by far the cheapest sector in the stock market right now. Um, my website's investmentresearchdynamics.com, and on there are links to the two newsletters that I that I publish. You know, subscription newsletters: the Mining Stock Journal and the Short Sellers Journal. Okay, and so if if gold goes up, I understand you're going to head out to your Tesla dealership and pick up a Tesla. <laughs> Okay, a little bit of an inside joke. If you want to know what that's about, go ahead and follow Dave on his, his Twitter account. <laughs> Dave, Dave Kranzer, we appreciate you being here and hope we can do it again soon. Patrick, that's awesome. <laughs> Thanks. That was Dave Kranzler sharing his view on the Fed and the economy. For more of Dave's insights, views, and services, please visit www.investmentresearchdynamics.com. If you like this video, please give us a thumbs up and subscribe to the SBTV channel. Audio versions can be found on iTunes and Spotify. 